It's uh, 11.03, it's top of the hour. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jeff Wong with EXP Realty, your 2022 Education Committee Vice Chair. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, virtual participants will be muted in the meeting. And we encourage everyone to please enter any questions you have into the chat box. The speaker will answer your question during the Q&A toward the end. This session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, West San Gabriel Valley Realtors. Um, well, I wanna welcome everybody um, to us and we have a very special guest speaker. We have Tony Escamella from Via Home Inspection. Tony is the owner and inspector of Via Home Inspection. He has been in the business for over 23 years and has been a licensed general contractor for 22 years. Tony is a certified residential and commercial construction inspector. He is also an NACHI certified home inspector. He was personally conducted close to 9,000 inspection. So let's give a warm welcome to Tony. And uh, from there, Tony, take it away. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know everybody has busy days and um, you have a lot of things going on, so I do appreciate the time that you're spending here with us today. Um, let me just adjust my, there we go. Okay, so um, a little bit about me. I'm going to set my timer here so I can stay on track because I can talk about this for days and days and days. Um, you actually have to shut me up, Jeff. Um, so um, as Jeff said, my name is Tony Escamilla. I'm the owner of uh, Villa Property Inspections. Um, we have been in a business for 24 years now. Um, I am a licensed contractor, uh, like Jeff mentioned, for the last 22 years. Um, and we service Los Angeles, Orange County, and the Inland Empire area, specifically the San Gabriel Valley area is our home base. Uh, we're based out of Claremont. I personally live in Claremont. And uh, part of the reason why we're having this chat today, because I happen to be in one of these fire zones that we're talking about, or that we're going to talk about. Um, I am an ICC certified residential and commercial construction inspector. And what that means is that I have the same certifications that your local city building inspector has. Um, NACHI certified uh, home inspector as well. And I am a post-disaster structural inspector for the state of California as well. And like you said, um, I, I have done over 9,000 inspections now. Uh, you lose track at some point and uh, it's, all, it's all good and fun. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, thank you so much for being here. And I, I realize you have other things to do. So I have, uh, I'm gonna open up with a gift to you. There's a link at the bottom of this page here. It's a private link, so it's not visible to anybody. So if you wanna download your free home maintenance manual, you can do so by screenshotting that and go into that page. Um, it covers a lot of uh, maintenance items and fire safety, pool safety, garages, electrical, roof maintenance. Uh, it has seasonal checklists at the end of the uh, book to uh, maintain your house. So yeah, feel free to download that and give that to anybody you want. Uh, so today, uh, today I wanna to cover a few things. Uh, we're gonna start with a little bit of wildfire history uh, here in California. And then what exactly is AB 38? Um, there's a lot of talk about it. Some things uh, started last year, some things will start in January of this year and some of them will start in 2025. Um, who's responsible for what? Um, let's see, um, fire hazard severity zones. And we'll talk about what those zones are. That basically tells you uh, where your property is located and if it's a fire zone or not, and whether this, this uh, AB 38 requirements apply to you. What is defensible space? You'll hear that a lot today, uh, defensible space. And then the car form, uh, I'm sure, most of you, if you're here in the San Gabriel Valley area, I invited a lot of people from our community as well um, over the last week. So if we have some people from our community, um, I'm sure that you probably live uh, in one of the uh, foothill areas. And so these car forms are not necessarily gonna apply to you, but stick around because we are gonna be talking about 
uh, home hardening. And this applies to pretty much everything in the San Gabriel Valley, some areas of, of Orange County, um, places like Roland Heights, Walnut. There's, uh, a, there's a map that you can go to to see all of this stuff. Also at the bottom of each one of these pages, you're gonna see a link to our page that has all of this information that we're talking about today it is centralized on that page. So a little bit of wildfire history. Uh, 1991 Berkeley um, fire it resulted in 25 deaths and over 3,000 lost homes. I'm going to move this. Sorry. I'm going to move this on this side here. There we go. Okay, 2003 San Diego Cedar fire, 15 deaths, over 2,000 structures. 2017, this is where we're Things started intensifying a little bit. Um, 2017, we had uh, the Tubbs fire, which resulted in 22 deaths and over 5,600 structures were lost. Unfortunately, we've been having a lot more fires than we used to in the past and their intensity has grown. 2017, the Thomas fire, I'm sure everybody uh, remembers that one resulted in two deaths. Sadly, there was a firefighter who uh, perished in that one and over a thousand homes. And then the biggest one that we've had and what prompted AB 38 was a 2018 campfire, which resulted in 89 deaths and over 18,000 structures lost. That is just enormously catastrophic. And so um, some things needed to be done. And, you know, the state has done and they're implementing a lot of, a lot of things um, as far as um, clearance uh, in the forest that's going to be happening this coming uh, season. Uh, however, um, the requirements of AB 38 go towards letting people know that they are in a fire zone and what they can do to minimize the chances of them, uh, of their, their structures um, uh, burning up during a, a fire, basically. So what exactly is AB 38? Uh, AB 38 was established as of July 1st of last year. Uh, and like I mentioned, there's parts of it were, which were established last year and parts of which are gonna start uh, in January. And it basically says that if you're selling a property um, and you're the seller of a real property and it's in a high or very high uh, fire hazard zone, uh, you have to provide with a buyer with documentation stating that the property is in compliance with defensible space and home hardening. These are two main topics for today, defensible space and home hardening. Defensible space is the area around the house and home hardening is what you can do to the actual house uh, to prevent um, wildfires from, from affecting you. So on the car forms, uh, if you haven't seen one yet, uh, you likely will. If you sell anything that is in a fire zone, um, you're probably gonna see this at some point. This is uh, yet one more disclosure that has to be signed by the buyer and the seller uh, when you're going through this transaction. However, I believe in my experience that this is a very, very important disclosure for many, many reasons. Um, one, uh, one thing to remember uh, about these forms is that it's not required for every transaction. And there are some uh, uh, requirements on the yellow box that you see up on top on section one, which tells you this only applies for uh, units, one to four units. It does not apply for multifamily. Uh, you don't see a lot of that in the foothills in the forest areas, but there are some and it really should apply to those as well. Um, also, if it is in a fire zone, and I'll talk about how to find out what that fire zone is uh, in a second. And if you're in that fire zone and if these things uh, apply to you. And it only applies to properties that were constructed prior to January 1st of 2010. In 2010, the building code changed. Um, it, the building code changes every two to three years. And in 2010, they enacted a lot of um, fire uh, restrictions on the newer building code. So the new construction is built to a, a completely different standard. But even then, we came to find out in 2017 and 2018 that 
it wasn't foolproof because we lost a lot of structures during forest fires that were built after 2010, and we came to find out why. Um, is a property the, the main thing for you as a realtor? Is a property located in a uh, high or very high fire hazard severity zone? Now, naturally, you're going to want to know this, and for the most part, your NHD report, your natural hazards report, is going to tell you whether it's located in a fire zone. However, I have seen some NHD reports that still do not have this information on there. And so you're kind of left holding a bag trying to figure out if it uh, applies to you or if it doesn't. I, I've uh, had a lot of agents call me and ask me, and they're calling the local building department, the local fire departments to find out. There is a very easy way to find out if your property, um, whether you're buying or you're selling or you're a homeowner in one of these areas, um, a very easy way to find out if you are uh, in a fire zone. And you can do so at this link right here. If you want to screenshot that, that will take you to a uh, page for CAL FIRE. And um, you basically, when you get to that page, there's uh, some icons on the left column. And at the very bottom icon is a pair of binoculars. And you click on that pair of binoculars and it'll give you a search function on the right side of the screen where you just type in your address. Type in your address and it'll show you exactly where you show up on the map and how close you are uh, to a fire zone or if you are in a fire zone. And so if you're in a fire zone or adjacent to a fire zone, there's a lot of things that we're gonna talk about today that really should, um, you really should consider whether you're buying or selling or you're just a homeowner. The, uh, um, this form, it's a disclosure, and like any other disclosure during a transaction, it's meant to limit the liability um, and, and have an understanding amongst all the, the, the parties of a transaction as to what condition the house is in. This, however, um, this particular form, I think is of great importance in a real estate transaction because it's one of those things where you can't just say, I don't know. Um, because if this house happens to burn up a year from now or two years from now in a uh, wildfire, this will probably be one of the first things they're going to look at. And was there any home hardening um, uh, that was done on the house? And so these are the kind of things that most sellers um, should know just by looking at their house, whether it applies or it doesn't. And so it's not one of these things that, um, that you can overlook and just, just sign. It really should be read carefully. Luckily, there is a, um, I think I'll get to it right now. There is uh, on page three of this particular form, FHDS, it, it actually walks you through step by step. And I've reviewed the document from beginning to end a few times and it's, it's very well written. Uh, it walks you through the entire process of filling out this form. So um, because of time limitations, I won't go into, into every detail on, on filling out forms. And also um, your, your local board of realtors probably isn't gonna um, care for me giving you legal advice. So um, just, just to suffice it to say that you really want to read this particular disclosure very closely and fill it out very carefully um, with your seller. So some of the uh, sections that you need to fill out, if these things do apply to you, if it is one to four units, if you are in a fire zone, um, then you need to fill out these uh, uh, questions here. And it's going to talk about roof eaves soffits, vent openings, do you have them? Um, are they uh, in excess of uh, one eighth inch um, wire mesh? Like the attic ventilation openings in um, for your attic that, that you see outside or the crawl space ventilation openings, are they in excess of one eighth of an inch? In 2010, it changed from one quarter inch openings on the wire mesh that you see in the crawl space entrance. Um, to one eighth, and it's because we came to realize that embers flying from a nearby um, 
uh, wildfire can easily penetrate into your crawl space and into your attic space. And so that's why they tightened that up. So you're gonna uh, wanna um, answer that question. And what type of roofing material do you have? Do you have wood shakes, wood shingles, or the asphalt shingles, um, or the cement tiles? And uh, do you have combustible landscaping uh, in zone zero? And I'll, I'll come, come back to zone zero right now because it's one of those things that is coming into effect in January of this coming year. Uh, single pane windows, one of the other things that we found out during the, the last um, um, building code change is that single pane windows don't hold up very well during a fire. If a forest fire or a wildfire happens to get close to your house, the sheer heat, even if the fire is not in your front yard, the sheer heat from a, a hundred wall tall uh, wall of fire will blow out your windows and your windows will shatter uh, in your house. And this is part of the reason when they ask you to evacuate these fires before the fires, because they wanna keep you out of uh, harm's way. And so, uh, tempered glass is a requirement now for windows. And tempered glass, if you've ever seen what a car window looks like when it breaks, it breaks into tiny, tiny little pieces um, or it has a film inside. And that's meant to prevent large pieces of glass from flying across the room and hurting you. And, uh, or keeping the glass intact if it has a film inside. And that's why it's a requirement for all new construction and fire zones to have tempered glass. And it's one of the requirements to disclose um, in, in this particular form. Bird stops. Um, again, one of the things that we found out during the uh, 2017 and 18 fires is that even if you have, um, concrete tiles or ceramic tile um, roof on your house. And you think that, okay, well, that's, that's fire uh, uh, proof. It's not gonna burn up. Well, at the ends of the um, roofs, at the edges of the roof, you have this little concave um, shape to the tiles and birds tend to get inside that area and create nests. And that's why they call these bird stops. So they go on the, ed on the ends of, at the edges of the roof. But that's also required now because uh, during the 2017-18 wildfires, we came to find that embers uh, flying in the air from a nearby wildfire also made their way in there and started fires underneath the, um, the tiles and literally burned your roof off. Now, because it was underneath the tiles, it's a lot harder for firefighters to even know that there is a fire or to put it out without actually tearing up uh, the roof. And so that's why bird stops um, are required now. A rain gutters with covers. This is one of the other uh, um, items on the form. And I'll get a little more in detail about these in a little bit. Um, there's different types of rain gutters, different types of covers, and that's just meant to keep leaves uh, from uh, piling up inside the gutters and drying out and, and then catching fire. Now, one of the important uh, uh, takeaways from this, from car forms, is that the buyer and the seller can agree that the buyer will be responsible for obtaining compliance within one year of closing escrow. So if Mr. Seller says, hey, uh, I have, I, the house doesn't really have any home hardening um, on it, and you still want to close escrow, uh, this is the opportunity to A, uh, negotiate a credit for uh, doing some of these things because trimming trees and adding some of these things can be uh, to the roofs can be rather expensive. And so it's a good opportunity for that, but then they come into an agreement that the buyer is going to do it and then the buyer will be responsible from that point forward for making those um, modifications to the house. Um, on section one, of this form, one of, of the questions is whether the state or local um, jurisdictions have an ordinance in place already to, um, as far as home hardening and brush clearance. 
And in answer to that, without going through city by city, um, in answer to that is yes. Just, uh, just assume that whatever city you're in has a local ordinance for brush clearance and home hardening because I've been doing this for 24 years and I have yet to find a city that doesn't. Um, most cities have some form uh, or the other of um, uh, an ordinance that requires brush clearance and, and home hardening. Now on that page uh, on our website that I mentioned earlier, there's a link where you can um, find your local city and find their municipal code. Uh, it's an index of all the local cities and their municipal codes. And then once you get into their municipal code, you can just type in fire or um, home hardening, and then it will show you whatever the local uh, ordinance is. And there's the address. <laughs> Let me see, do we have any questions? Whoops, how do I get out of here? There we go, sorry about that. Yeah, I believe the question so far uh, has been looking for the, the links and uh, we provided that. Uh, and, I th and then also kind of, if you can go into other suggestions on, on what else we should look for in the form um to be to be to be careful on um i think that was the other question and another one that just came in is um oh this is just a request to to hide the gray um to kind of make your window larger if if it's possible uh on my end it's not unfortunately um and mine is full screen so i'm not sure if there's if there's gray on uh on your side or what that looks like Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. If you, uh, oh, Kimberly has her hand up. Thank you. Um, when I asked uh, if you, how to fill out very carefully if you do not know the answer, because sometimes I'll be with my clients and I feel like I need to be an inspector to help them fill this out sometimes, right? And because what if you don't know the answer? What if they don't know? Yeah if there's loose or missing that, stopping? That is a great question. Um, most of the things on here, for example, uh, do you have wood shake roof? Um, homeowners will, will know that. Um, do you have uh, bird stops? Uh, I, I can see how that's one of the questions where if you don't even know what a bird stop is, um, you might not know. And um, you, you fill it out to the best of your ability. Basically, I do um, stress that, you know, it's a, when I'm with my clients, I say it's as are you aware of? And so they do, yes. do answer no. And I get that. But when you say answer carefully, I just didn't know. Are there what I guess what extra steps yeah. can be? Is there a site? I think you were mentioning an address to check for city ordinances. Is there a particular site to do that? Yeah. Yeah. On the link there at the bottom of the screen that you see right now on the bottom okay. right, right there. Yeah, that's uh, what if I you go up. So I don't see you, that I'm asking. Yeah, there is a link there that says check your local ordinance if you keep oh, scrolling down. The ins wait, no. More about the defensible space. Is that keep no. going? Oh goodness gracious. I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I can't <scroll laughs> I'm only seeing the screen that's let, shared. Let me let me bring it up here on uh, on my phone here. Um I had it a second ago and I know it's there because I put it up there yesterday. If you scroll down uh, from the beginning, it tells you what is AB 38, uh, fire hazard. your screen. I, I don't have control to scroll. Oh, okay. I see. All right. Yeah. On that link, uh, when you go to that page, oh, that's that's pa link. the page. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You click on that link and you go to our, our page and you scroll down on the page. Okay. And Thank and there's a, there's a title, yeah, that says local ordinances, and you can search your local ordinance. Like I said, once you find a city that you're, that okay. you're in, just type in like fire or, or home hardening, and it'll show you what the exact ordinance is. Thanks for clarifying. Appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, I packed that page, by the way, with as much information as possible. And even in preparation for, for uh, speaking today, I did a lot of research on this topic. And it can be very, very overwhelming. And I've been doing this for a long time. 
uh, there is just a lot of information out there. So I tried as best I could to streamline this for you so that uh, you get the major points of the things that you actually need without diving into like 20 different pages online for different sites. Um, so um, some wildfire uh, facts. In 2021, 7,300, almost 7,400 wildfires in California. Now we've had uh, some, this includes all, all of the, the, the smaller ones as well, but that has intensified from the previous year and the previous year from that. So um, the ongoing um, consensus right now is that we don't have a fire season anymore here in California. Uh, fire season is pretty much year long. As we speak right now, this normally wouldn't be considered, we'd be at the very end of the fire season. Um, but as we speak right now, we have red flag warnings today. We're getting Santa Ana winds later on today and into tomorrow. And, um, and all fire stations are, are on high alert right now because fire season is just one of those things that's just gonna be an ongoing issue here in California. Um, two and a half million acres burned just last year. Um, over half of uh, wildfire home fires are due to embers. And that picture that you see on, on the screen right now, that's, that's what it looks like. And it's crazy. Um, those embers can travel up to a mile in a wind-driven fire, like uh, if there was a fire, you know, with the Santa Ana's going on. Uh, those embers can travel, and more than half of the wildfires uh, the, on the homes are, that burn down are because of embers, and this is what home hardening is about. Uh, we want defensible space so that the vegetation near your house doesn't burn and cause the, hot, the house to burn, but we also want to harden your home so that those embers don't burn the house down. Uh, fires from embers are usually unseen, um, especially if the area has been evacuated. And, um, you know, I know sometimes people stay behind, but there's a lot of reasons why you should, if, if you're asked to evacuate, you should. But a little bit of preparation beforehand goes a long way. Um, some of these fires, like what I just described a little while ago about the bird stops and the embers getting underneath the roof tiles. Those are the kind of fires that start without you even knowing and you won't find out until your house is really, really engulfed. Um, these embers will land on roofs and I'll, I'll touch on clearing your roof in a little while and what you should do. They land on roofs, they go into attic spaces. The ventilation, if you have older attic vents that have that don't have, I can't tell you how many attic vents I see that have no wire mesh on them at all. It just has little louvers and uh, animals can get in, but more importantly, embers can get in there, touch a fire off inside the attic and you won't even know for you know a good 10, 15 minutes when the house is really on fire. Uh, same thing, uh, areas under a deck. I, I frequently see uh, in, in more wooded areas and, and even in not so wooded areas, I see a lot of leaves, a lot of dry material. I see paint cans. I see all kinds of stuff under people's decks and I get it. It's a good open space. It's great for storage, um, but not really. And under the crawl spaces, under the house. Um, embers can get under the house and, and touch up a fire uh, from under the house as well. So defensible space. Defensible space is meant to go, like I said, in conjunction with home hardening. And we have different zones. And one of the, those new zones is gonna be apply uh, in January of this coming year. Um, there's three different zones. We have zone one, which is zero to 30 feet. It used to be zero to 50 feet. And, but we came to find out that we should get a little closer and do a little deeper cleaning around the house. And it's, think of it as cleaning uh, is what you need to do. And it's remove all dead vegetation. Um, in the winter time, there's not much you can do about um, bushes that go dormant. They, they're very dry, but there's a lot of leaves that they drop that should be cleared away from the house. 
um, I think I have a good picture I'm gonna put up right now where you can see that the area at the bottom of the house surrounding the house is on fire. And it's because all the, the leaves caught on fire and that's what, what touches off fires in homes. Um, in this zone, you also wanna remove any dead branches away from your roof. Uh, to have those trimmed back at least a good 10 feet from your chimney away, 10 feet away from your roof, uh, period. And wood piles. I see um, firewood stacked up three feet high behind people's houses. Um, and, it, you know, a good fireplace is really cool. Um, but during a fire, that's one of the first things that's going to go off. Um, and because it is firewood and it is stacked up, it is a big source of fuel that's going to burn really fast. And so um, the recommendation is to move it to zone two, which is anywhere 30 feet away from the house, uh, a utility shed, uh, preferably a metal shed uh, and not a wood shed um, or, or somewhere uh, far away from the house. Zone two is 30 to 100 feet from the house. Um, and that's meant to have any grass areas, any bushes, anything down to no, no taller than four inches. Um, that's just to, to keep it from burning. The lower it is to the ground, the less chances are that it's gonna touch, touch off a fire uh, on your tree. And so the, one of the things, I don't know if I put it here, but you also need to trim your trees to a height of six feet. Any branches that are lower than six feet should be trimmed so that if something does touch off on the ground, some dry leaves, something touches off, it's not gonna set the tree on fire. And wood piles, 10 feet, 10 foot of clearance. Um, firewood, for example, if you put it out in zone two, it should have clearance from other combustible materials or be inside a metal shed, like I said. Uh, zone two continued. Uh, this is what I was talking about, the trees. While it might not stop uh, a fire from spreading, if the, if the fire is close and it's close to your house, it might not stop it, but it, it if you can at least slow it down uh, enough to give you time to get out, um, it, it might make the difference. So A, B, 3074, this was back in 2020. This is what created zone zero. Zone zero is zero to five feet away from your house. That is the immediate area surrounding the house. And I can't tell you how many times I see all kinds of things that are highly flammable in those areas, particularly, and I'll touch on it in, in a second, uh, areas under porches, areas under stairs, um, along the sides of the house in, in the side yards. And this is coming into effect in January of 2023. There is gonna be another addition to your car form about this. So if you haven't received the new car form, it's gonna be coming soon and there's gonna be one more check mark um, about zone zero. Uh, the overall consensus for all of these zones in defensible space is the area within a hundred feet of your if you control the area within 100 feet of your house or to the property line, there's not much you can really do outside of your property line, except in conjunction with your neighbors. It's always a good idea to do that. Um, but science has found that if you control that area within 100 feet of your house, the chances of your house surviving during a wildfire go up ex exponentially. Uh, and it makes the, the job of the firefighters a lot easier, uh, knowing when they walk in, into a, um, a space like this, knowing that this one is better taken care of, and it makes it easier to defend your house. And that's why they call it defensible space. So home hardening tips. Um, there are a lot of things. There's the picture I was telling you about a second ago. This is an actual fire and all of the grass area and bushes and dry leaves that were surrounding this house were the very first things that caught on fire. And if you look at the roof, there's a couple of embers uh, that caught on fire on the roof as well. 
because the next thing that's going to catch on fire with the embers, and you can see the embers in this picture, are the dry leaves and vegetation on the roof. And so um, I do recommend that you have, if you have trees around your house, even if you're not in a fire zone, this is just uh, good practice. Uh, because what I've seen also is when a fire happens in somebody's house, um, even if you're not in a fire zone, if you're in close proximity to your neighbor's house and your neighbor's house is not taken care of, you can easily take your neighbor's house as well. And this is why we have uh, setbacks in houses where you can't build all the way to the property line in the backyards and the sides is because we wanna have that separation between the two structures, one on either side of the property line that gives you, you know, five feet on one side, five feet on the other side, it, that's 10 feet from structure to structure. If there's a fire in one structure, it's not going to burn your house down. But part of doing that is to clean your roof off. And it's a matter of just either getting up there yourself or having somebody get up there with a blower and just blow off any leaves. Um, roof gutters. Uh, roof gutters, I see a lot of PVC roof gutters. And PVC does not do very well in a fire. So I always recommend if you're gonna install roof gutters in your house, install metal roof gutters and put a cover on, on the roof gutters, uh, a metal cover that will prevent the buildup of leaves inside the gutter. Those are usually the first things that go off in a fire, uh, particularly during a wildfire. Um, 100 feet, 100 feet, 100 feet. Uh, you'll, you'll hear that a lot. Um, as far as home hardening and defensible space, uh, you want to clear any dry brush, uh, any dead branches, um, anything that might catch fire. Even um, I've seen a lot of uh, um, playhouses uh, for kids. If it's wood, it will catch fire. Yeah. Uh, you want to clear the leaves. Um, if you have a from the rooftop, as we were just talking about, um, it, periodically uh, you want to clear those, particularly once we start getting into the heavy fire season, like early summer, late fall, clear the roof gutters at least once a year. Uh, that clearing your roof gutters once a year does a lot more than just fire prevention. Um, I can't tell you how much damage I see to houses that is moisture related when we're doing inspections because A, it doesn't have roof gutters or B, the roof gutters are not installed properly and you get a lot of moisture penetration on the roof eaves. It rots out all the roof eaves and then it causes leaks into the house. Uh, leaves, uh, I mentioned this a little while ago also. On top of decks, I see like the picture here, I see piles and piles of leaves on top of decks uh, regularly. They're piled. If you haven't used your patio, you haven't used your deck in a while, sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, um, there's a lot of stuff in the back and you want to make sure that you clear everything so that it's not a, a, um, a possibility of, of adding to a, a fire or making a fire a lot more easy to, uh, to get started. Uh, under the decks, under the stairs, under the porches, all of that, particularly that stuff has to be cleared out more. Relocate firewood to zone two and trim uh, tree branches away uh, from the house. Little plants, the picture that we saw previously, uh, one of the things that it did have going for it is that those were low plants. The plants that are in the planters around your house, you wanna trim them and keep them as low as possible because the higher they are, the higher that they can set off the roof eaves. When a fire starts, it's very intense and it goes up really quickly. And if it gets caught on the roof eave under your house, um, it'll spin underneath the roof eave and it'll burn the roof eave off and then you'll start a fire. So the lower that the plants and the vegetation are surrounding your, the immediate area in zone zero of your house, uh, the better. And one of the other things that I see on some newer construction, uh, newer than um, 2010, we have a lot of stucco um, houses here in, in, in Southern California, but there are some areas that still have wood siding. And particularly in the fire zone, uh, this is very critical because if you have a, a bush 
uh, like this time of year, um, the leaves fell off, it's pretty dry. And uh, if that bush, like in the picture, were to catch fire and you have wood siding on your house, it will set off the fire to the wood siding immediately. So I always recommend that there be at least a foot uh, distance between your vegetation and the house for two reasons. Number one, for fire safety. Number two, uh, the vegetation usually tends to cause some kind of cosmetic damage or rust. It makes it a lot harder to maintain the walls and, and repaint when you need to repaint. And it attracts rodents. Um, so I see that a lot. But yeah, you definitely want to have at least a good foot between the vegetation and the actual house. Um, patio furniture. Um, patio furniture in patios, particularly if it's wood, uh, patio furniture, and I have a chair just like that, a couple of chairs in my, in my patio right now. It's not a deck, it's a patio. Um, it can catch fire, and, and I see leaves accumulate uh, on top of patio furniture. And that's like um, it, the, the stuff that you use to start your, your campfire. It will catch really quickly, and then it'll burn the, um, the patio furniture. I always recommend, and you can buy these on Amazon, they're very inexpensive. You can use covers just like this that are fire resistant. Um, very similar to the material that you use if you have a barbecue in your backyard and you have a cover on it, you know what I mean. There's some really good material that you put on top of it and it prevents the um, furniture from catching fire. And it also uh, extends the life of the furniture. Um, cushions, planters, wooden planters, I always recommend tuck them in underneath uh, the covers as well. Um, some of these cushions are not fire rated or any other thing, just look around your house and anything that can catch fire, stick it under one of the covers, make sure that the cover itself is not accumulating leaves and just clear out any leaves. Um, if you have a deck, or if you know somebody who's buying a deck and you're representing a buyer or they wanna build a deck in their house, I always recommend that they use a um, non-combustible material like Trex. And Trex is a brand name. It's a composite wood. It's almost like plastic, but it looks exactly like wood. It does not catch fire um, when embers land on it. And the, the frame of the deck underneath can be made out of wood. But if the railings and the top of the railings and the deck material are made out of a material like Trex, um, it, it really goes a long way from preventing a, a fire. Now, uh, if a deck, if you happen to be in a hilly area and we're in a foothill, so there's a lot of hilly areas and you have a deck in your backyard and if there's a downslope where the deck is located, you want to clear the area on the, on the low side of the deck even further back because those flames, if there was something burning down slope from your house, those flames would naturally go underneath your deck. And this is why it's important to not have anything stored underneath your deck and clear out um, leaves. I've seen about that much uh, depth of oak tree leaves underneath decks on a regular basis. And those are really, really dry, really, really flammable. So um, yeah, if you do have a deck, if it is on a hillside, that additional clearance uh, goes a long way, but making sure that there's nothing under the deck as well um, helps out. Doors and windows. Um, whether you're home or you decide to evacuate during a wildfire, or you're asked to evacuate during a wildfire, you want to close all doors and windows tightly. And I put pet doors on here. Um, there has been a couple of cases where embers got into a house through a pet door. And um, you know, I assume that if you're gonna evacuate your house, you're probably gonna take your pets with you. So you would wanna have that closed so that the embers don't get inside and touch off a fire in your, in your carpet or on your furniture inside the house. And you might wanna consider installing um, metal shutters if you're in a fire zone. They have some really cool low um, 
uh, low profile shutters that look really nice on the outside of the house. But for security reasons and for fire safety, you can close them whenever you need to. And this prevents uh, the heat from a fire from blowing out the glass in the windows, number one, and then making its way inside, um, inside the house. And as you can see in the picture, you can do them with a remote control and they're really cool. I've, I've had the, uh, the experience of uh, inspecting a few of these and they're really cool. Uh, tempered glass, we talked about tempered glass and why it's important. If you're in the house, um, even if it's not a fire, uh, a, a, a fire condition, a wildfire, you should consider where you put, uh, there's certain requirements of where you have to put it, but you should consider uh, installing tempered glass throughout the house. If you happen to fall, if you have children, uh, I know somebody, and I won't mention names, um, I know somebody who recently went to a um, party and slammed into the very, very clean glass door, sliding glass door leading to the patio, uh, thinking it was open. Um, so in the event that, you, that a, a glass breaks, again, you want it to shatter uh, into tiny little pieces and not large pieces that can cut you. Uh, cover vent openings, uh, particularly if you have an older house, uh, pay very close attention to the vent openings to your attic. This is the number one space where um, wildfire embers get into, um, under your house and inside the attic. So if you don't, if you haven't looked in your own house or uh, if you have a client, make that recommendation uh, to add, uh, it doesn't cost a lot, to add a wire mesh on the inside of the attic to prevent embers from coming in. There's also covers that you can use, and I'll bring up a picture right now, removable vent covers that are very easily installed. And in the event that there is a wildfire anywhere within a mile of your house, which happens very frequently on the foothills here, I live in Claremont, just right, right below a baseline for anybody who's familiar with the area, um, if you're within a mile of this, those embers can affect your house. So installing vent covers like this, you pop that cover on it and you don't have to worry about anything. Three things that a, that a fire needs, whether it's a, uh, a wildfire or any fire in a house that it needs in order to thrive. Um, it needs a spark, it needs fuel, and it needs oxygen. And so by installing vent covers on your crawl spaces and in your attic space, you're removing the oxygen from that equation so that even if an ember were to get into your attic space, for example, through somewhere else, it doesn't have the oxygen to continue burning. So it won't start a, a major fire inside your attic space or inside your house. Now, while having the mesh is really nice, the one eighth inch maximum mesh is really nice. You still have uh, on a wind driven uh, fire like the Santa Ana's that we're having today and tomorrow. If there was a fire, that wind and the wind that a fire creates all by itself will blow from one side of your crawl space to the other side of your crawl space. If there's an ember there, uh, it's fanning, literally fanning the flames of, of that fire. However, if you install these covers here, you just remove the oxygen from that equation and it, it, it increases the chance of your house surviving. And we talked about bird stops, same thing. You, you wanna stop any place where embers might, might accumulate and start a fire. Um, last but not least, um, have a plan. If you are um, in a fire zone, and um, like I said, I, I invited some friends from our community to come here because they're in, in uh, fire zones as well. If you are in a fire zone, you should have a plan. And you should have a plan a, a lot sooner than any potential fire season. Um, create and maintain your defensible space that we talked about. Uh, speak with your family beforehand, especially if you have kids. It's the same principles that we have for earthquake preparedness. Speak with your kids. It's, it's a scary thing for adults, but for kids, it's even scarier. 
during a forest fire, even if it's not as close. Um, things like, where will you go if you have to evacuate? If you're made to evacuate or you're asked to evacuate, where would you go? Would you stay with a family member? Would you stay at a local shelter, um, a hotel? You should have a game plan ahead of time as to where you, where you would go. What will you be taking with you? And then I've heard this a lot, and unfortunately, some people who have lost their houses, um, when you're asked to evacuate uh, because the fire is getting closer, the panic is, what should I take with me? Um, should I take uh, memories? Should I take photos? Should I take the laptop? Should I uh, um, take it, it, things that people forget, medications? If you're gonna be away from your house for several days and you're on any kind of medication or anybody in your, in your family is on medication, um, have a list of those medications so that you can just plop them into a bag and go. Um, special needs, are there any special needs? Uh, elderly, uh, children. Um, having toys for children, for example, if you have to evacuate, coloring books, things like that that will keep them entertained uh, is, is a good idea. And the same thing goes for elderly people as well. Uh, I know that uh, there are here in the San Gabriel Valley, I see a lot of multi-generational uh, families. And so it, it, it makes sense to take, make sure that you're taking care of everybody in the household if you have to evacuate your house, whether it be for a forest fire or an earthquake. Pets, um, it's crazy, but if, uh, if you're on the run and you have to make a quick decision, um, it's really difficult if you have a dog or a cat and you have nothing to put them in and you put them into your car. Um, I, it, it makes for an interesting drive. So you should have a pet carrier for small pets. You should make plans to uh, how, how you would transport them in a hurry and not have to go dig out the pet carrier that's on top of the third shelf in the garage behind uh, a, a few other boxes. Uh, if you have large animals, uh, there's a lot of areas that have larger animals. Um, do you have plans uh, to evacuate large animals? Securing your home. Um, sadly, there has been instances where evacuation orders are given and people have taken advantage of that. And you hear about it in the news every so often, uh, and it does happen. It's, it's, it's very sad that something like that happens, but you should have a plan as to how would I secure my home if I'm gonna be gone for two or three days. Having those shutters that, I, that we spoke about, those metal shutters, it's a good idea. They're great for security. Uh, alarm systems probably won't work because you'll probably lose power. So how would you secure your doors? How would you secure your windows? How would you secure your sheds, your garages, um, even your vehicles? And last but not least is one of the most important things you can do is make sure that you have your uh, insurance documents. Um, either scan them, you should probably have a copy outside of your house of your insurance documents and have a uh, inventory of the major items in your home for your insurance carrier so that in the event that something happens uh, and something catastrophic happens, um, when you return from, from that, uh, you have at least your insurance documents on hand to get the ball rolling as quickly as possible. You have to remember that after a, um, an earthquake or a fire, um, insurance companies get flooded get flooded with phone calls and claims. And so if you have all your documentation in place ahead of time, it makes it that much quicker for you to recover from uh, some unfortunate uh, circumstance. Um, so in wrapping up, um, I have a blog and I, I nerd out, I, I joke about this, but I nerd out about these kind of things. I write uh, and I, in, You've probably received one of my emails at some point. I send out about all kinds of topics. Um, I send mostly educational stuff, uh, but please feel free to drop by. Uh, there are some articles on there about interior um, um, fire safety, exterior fire safety. There are articles about smoke and carbon monoxide requirements. Um, 
water heater requirements, foundation problems, and how to avoid foundation problems, um, fire safety, earthquake safety, pool safety, seasonal maintenance checklist. And if you want, you can subscribe and you'll get the periodic blogs when I do send them out. I don't spam. I promise I won't spam. I only send out educational stuff. But uh, yeah, feel free to check that out. Make sure you download the home maintenance manual, the link that I put up earlier. Um, so with that, thank you so much. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer them. And if I can't answer them, I promise you I'll get you an answer. Thank you, Tony. I do believe uh, there is a hand raise from Craig Ashley. Craig, um, how you doing, Craig? Craig, I just asked to unmute you. Oh, no wonder it didn't work. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to share, hey, Tony, how you doing? I wanted hey, to Craig. share a couple of things that we've just seen in my office. Uh, we just had a $20 million house in escrow. And one of the things that we're doing now to all the other agents is we're telling people to start their insurance hunt immediately as soon as, op as we open escrow. Uh, we just had this deal fall apart because they found out there was in a high uh, severity area, fire severity area, and the insurance for this house was going to be $800,000 a year. So the buyer backed out. One of the other things that we're doing now is we're telling people before they put their house on, uh, on the market to get up on the roof and blow it off, clean out the gutters. You want the inspection to go as smooth as possible. If that means brush removal, do that before you have the inspection. Those are all things that could become negotiating uh, nightmares during the escrow. So that, that's all I wanted to share. Absolutely, I agree 100%. Uh, those are those things that, um, there, there is one article on that blog on how to prepare your house for a home inspection. Um, so if, if you're gonna be listing, um, a house, uh, you definitely want to take a read on that um, because the chances are pretty high that you're going to get a home inspector like myself to go through the house and um, you don't want to have to be dealing with negotiating for making some of these repairs, uh, especially things that are very simple to take care of uh, beforehand. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tony. I'm looking at the chat. I think uh, we've answered all the questions. Awesome. Great. So, so I will, um, I'll finish like I always finish when I do these uh, uh, presentations and I, I mean it 100%. If you have any questions um, uh, beyond this, please don't hesitate. Reach out to me. Um, the phone number is uh, on the screen there. You can text to that phone number and it makes it to my cell phone. Uh, you can't see it, but it makes it to my cell phone. Um, I, I don't have any issues uh, answering any questions. I get a lot of realtors who will be at a site uh, looking at a property. They'll, they'll text me a picture and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? I, I, like I said, I've been doing this for 24 years. Uh, I've inspected over 9,000 homes. I, I am more than happy to uh, uh, share as much information as, as I can. Very good. All right, uh, we're at the top of the hour. It's 12.02. Uh, I think there's no more questions. There's just a handful of gratitude and thanks for, the, for giving us this awesome presentation. Thank you. So on behalf of the West San Gabriel Valley Realtors, we would like to thank Tony for being our guest speaker and for your informative presentation today. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of useful and interesting upcoming classes. On November 16, 2022, uh, we have a CRMS virtual training list for success with CRMLS. On November 18th, we have 45 hours of DRE license renewal continuing education webinar. On November 21st, we have the Zipform Plus hybrid training. We hope to see you there. Until then, goodbye everyone. Thank you everybody.